Dadu building a fire. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Here we are. Raymore, Missouri. 2022. Hey, Dadu, how do you feel that you're introducing your grandson to his first fire? Well, it's kind of my grandma introduced me to my first fire. <laughs> we were tearing her pigeons out of a Sears Roebuck catalog, throwing them in the fire. Or we'd pull ticks off the dog, throw the ticks in the fire. They'd pop. Really? Oh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're too close, Wilder. Oh, <laughs> we better move back. Saw the sweetest old gal come into Price Chopper yesterday. Yeah? She had about five big hairs on her chin, but she was just sweet as she could be. Really? Yeah. Did you, did you ask her if she I wanted asked her them if I to could be plucked? plucked. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask her. <laughs> oh, I met some interesting people up there. So Thanksgiving 2022. What's, what's I know. How special is this? This is uh, this is our third time doing this, Dadu. Yes, it's an epic uh, year. It certainly is. Having my children all under my roof last night. What's it uh, like having your your grandson playing in the yard with him? Well, I kind of planned ahead on that. The little jewels that he found, the little glass beads, I planted them there last year and the year before, just getting ready for this. So oh, that's pretty awesome. I've been awesome. looking forward to it for some time. Yeah. And uh, had the angel there with the jewels in front of her. And, yep, this was all part of the plan. But my favorite thing was not my grandson, but my idiot son and my grandson trying to ride around on a, a little Jeep that's only designed for a 40-pounder, not 240 pounds. Uh, aren't you shocked that I was able to ride on that You're thing? You're incredible. It was so, it was so awesome. I, I had no idea. But I figured... Reimburse me for three hundred dollars if you break it, and it'd be fine. <laughs> why, why do all the things <laughs> that you buy at garage sales then because, they go up in value? Because a lot? I buy them at fantastic prices. And you would have to pay the real. I'd have to pay retail. Retail, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things they taught me in sales early on. Never cut a deal for family members because really? they're. Oh yeah, That's they said a rule that they teach <laughs> absolutely. They, what a slime ball business. No, not at all. Because family members are going to take advantage of you. They're going to mm -hmm. they're going to want to bother you and harass you. And you when you could be selling a car to somebody else, they're going to be back. Sure, wanting a freebie, wanting something for nothing. So yeah. yes, but no, um, life's good. This has been a fantastic Thanksgiving, and then uh, to get the word that not only is my my number one grandson king of the hill but he's got a little baby brother on the way that made it even better that's yeah, pretty cool huh yes it was yeah yes it was and then to get my outlaw i mean i'm sorry my in-laws in here all under one roof and nobody killed them each other that was accomplishment too yeah and so uh that was uh life is good life is good yeah i know we're sitting out by the fire in the backyard in raymore missouri at an undisclosed location. This is God's country, folks. This ain't the left coast or a bunch of liberals on the east coast. <laughs> this is paradise here. <laughs> we're, we're Bible thumpers and gun lovers and, well, I used to say Trump lovers, but not anymore. That that love affairs. That horse left the barns some time back. Right, right. So we're not. We don't fly any Trump flags in my neighborhood. Thank but God. The, but, but but there used to be there used to be a lot of uh, of that in this neighborhood, right? Oh, a lot not, of Trump not flags in, back well, in the day. Not in this immediate neighborhood, but all around here. If you'd see guys flying flags in their backyard, mm -hmm. flags on their pickup trucks, yeah, and all that. But I think the love affairs, <laughs> unless the hardcore birthers and truthers and all the ones that are with trump from the beginning they're not going to divorce him but thinking normal people have left him in droves i think this right, last right, year right. so but politics aside you know we all ate too much yesterday what is a good day and uh gosh here we are third time <laughs> so uh did i want to talk to you about uh the last couple of times i've had you on um we we talked uh about uh the trilogy of uh, of wives you had, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, probably a subject I was way too much in detail on. So I'll spare your audience that this time. Right, right. I want to talk to you about because uh, you have a really interesting um, childhood and teenage years, 
that uh, uh, obviously my listeners and viewers don't know anything about, but uh, you grew up as a as a kid of a missionary in the Cayman Islands for part of your childhood. Yeah, you know, imagine the Cayman Islands back in the fifties before the drug thing hit, which was more like the sixties and seventies, and. Uh, the uh, biggest crime that would be committed on the island I lived on, Cayman Brack, was maybe a guy running into a palm tree that had too much rum in him on Sunday, Saturday night. And, uh, of course, uh, I was a little boy. Going, my mom and dad were both ministers and missionaries. And uh, I certainly uh, believed what they taught me. And I believe that, you know, if you're drinking rum, you're a horrible person. And there was a guy that owned a bar named Blackie on the island. His and his name was actually his name Blackie? Was Blackie. Yeah, that, well, nickname, nickname. That that's you know, it's very common. Now, now, did he go by that or was oh, he? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. His name was Blackie. Everybody uh, called him Blackie. Okay, no, and he but was I'm Black. saying, does he well, like his name? See, in the Cayman Islands, I'm sure other people <laughs> called him that. Oh but no, I'm, no, he lived the part, big black guy, and, and he he loved it. But no, he owned a bar. I think maybe the only bar in my part of the island. And uh, of course, my mom and dad preached against the evils of rum, demon rum. And demon I, rum is what they called it. Well, no, not they didn't call it that. Right. It's been called that, but yeah, they call it the evils of alcohol. And so I proceeded to take things into my own hands. Blackie went by in his big black car one day, and I decided to throw rocks at his car. And, and Thought, he, thinking that you were doing and he, the Lord's work, yes, yeah, do, oh, of course, doing God's work, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. Of course, he didn't. He saw that you know, a little white boy on the you know there because think Cayman Islands, ten uh, percent were truly black. They weren't African American. They were more like Carib Indian, some uh, s- descendants of slaves. But for the most part, uh, 80% of them were uh, probably mixed and maybe only 10% white. The white people lived down at the east end of the island. They didn't want to associate with the blacks. So the gene pool got real small. They were all a little bit crazy because they all married each other. So the word was out on the whiteies down at that other end of the island. <laughs> anyway. They were a little crazy down there? Yeah. They had one guy, I think they hired him to work in a hardware store. They sent him around the island looking for a board stretcher. And he'd go from one store to the other, and they'd say, oh, we're out of them. You need to go to another store. So he made the rounds, to, and I don't think he ever really realized that such a thing doesn't exist, but they had a lot of fun with him. But, but that was <laughs> – so anyway, I proceeded to throw rocks at Blackie's car, and uh, Blackie saw the little white missionary's boy hiding behind a bush, and, and the lady that was doing some uh, – caretaking with she kind of babysitting my younger brother he told her he said if he'd been if he hadn't been the missionary's boy i'd have jumped out and i'd have given him a good flogging yeah well she told my mom and dad guess what not only did i get a good flogging but they told her to take the word back to blackie that we definitely gave him one for you yeah yeah, yeah. so i never did throw any more rocks at blackie's car or blackie and uh that was kind of the extent of it. But as a child in the Caymans, if Did you, you think about it. Did you rocks at any Whitey's cars in the future? <laughs> <laughs> oh, later on in, as I grew up. Oh, I've always loved th- fire. I love fire and I love throw things. That's just two of my downfalls. But, uh, no, the Cayman Islands was paradise in the 50s. I mean, good grief. I lived, you know, we didn't. We, a family of five, we were getting, I think, 300 a month from the mission board, but that included a company car, I mean, a company car, a missionary's car, and a place to live. And, uh, you know, 300 a month was a lot of money back in 1955. Sure. That's like 3,000 or more now or more. And uh, the ocean was about uh, 200 yards from our front door. So I could hear the ocean at night going to sleep. That was my white noise. Was the waves crashing on the rocks? Mm-hmm. And it what don't you're imagining a sandy beach now? If you if you, most people get a picture of this Cayman Brack, not at all. Uh, Cayman Brack was very volcanic, so you had all this. They call them iron beaches. It was like walk. The rock was so sharp that unless you had toughened up your feet for it, you couldn't even walk on it. Really? But as a kid, we walked on it all the time, so we got toughened up. Sure. So we'd run out there and run on the rock and whatnot, fish, and uh, I'd catch little tiny fish, not big stuff. What kind of fish? Do you remember what kind of fish? Uh, they were called sand sharks. We called them shanties for short, but sand shark, little tiny stuff. We'd use, we'd make our own hooks. We'd bend a pin and get our own fish line, make our own hooks. What would but, you make uh, with bait? Uh, the bait would be uh, probably. Um, would you dig up worms? Worms? No, the uh, I don't know that I ever saw earthworm. Uh, it, it was probably um, there was a snail, a little cut a piece of snail. And, You'd uh, find snail like on the on the rocks. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, the snails were delicious. Uh, absolutely. You, they were, they, they called them whelks. They were, they were a large snail and you, the way you ate them, you'd throw them in a fire 
and then after the, the fire would roast them, and then as they, they died, they would expand, and they would ease themselves out of the shell, and then the entrails would be on the end of the meat, and you just tear the entrail off and eat the meat. It was delicious. So really? I, I ate snail meat as a very young person and loved it. Wow. Yeah. But I'm not a big escargot. I didn't know you were this cultured. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't called escargot. It was just snails, but uh, yeah. Wilkes was called. But yeah. But so, uh, yeah, we uh, we had no running water. We had to pump our own. Well, the running water we had was pumped up. If you've seen a, a movie of the Australia ba- outback back mm-hmm. in the 40s, 30s, there'd be a tower with two drums up on top. Yeah. You'd pump the water up to the drums manually. We would do that every day, and that way we'd have running water from the tanks that we pump. If you didn't pump it up, you didn't have any running water. Wow. So that's And then uh, the sun would heat the water up, of course, in the hot tropic sun, so you'd have warm water bath. Wow. But the drinking water was from a cistern, and that was water runoff. Of course, we didn't know much about nuclear waste and stuff back in the 50s. This was before, I think, Russia was still exploding nuclear stuff into the atmosphere. So we probably drank a little bit of nuclear waste in our, in our rainwater in the cistern. But uh, you depended on the rain for your drinking water. There were no wells on the on the island at all. So, But, yeah, paradise. We had uh, almond trees. We had uh, mango trees everywhere. Would you go out and pick your own mangoes yeah. and almonds and yeah, everything? You could, yeah, you could pick them. They were just. Uh, and they were just kind of on the island, so um, anybody could just pick them. Uh-huh. It wasn't like in anybody's yard or anything. Yep, like no, that. we weren't going into anybody's yard. Now there were people who were kind of territorial about their yards. They used, they didn't build fences like you see today. Maybe now they have. I've like I said, I've, I've not been back to Cayman Brack, been to Grand Cayman uh, in the last few years, but I haven't been back to Gr- Cayman Brack since I was a child. But back then they used, they made stone walls like you'd see in New England. Yeah, you know, uh, Frost writes about uh, the mending wall. Very much so. Same way. You'd build you'd build stone walls around your property. Well, my sister had a chicken, and she'd raised a little chicken as a pet. And the neighbor, it would get over the fence and get in the neighbor's garden. And our neighbor told us, he said, I, I will not tolerate that chicken getting in my garden. I'll probably have to shoot it. Well, it got into the garden, and sure enough, he shot the chicken with a shotgun or whatever. And uh, he brought it over to us because he felt obligated to at least bring us our chicken back. Right. So we had chicken dinner that Sunday, and I still remember my sister Marilyn cried all the way through the meal while we ate her chicken. <laughs> you ate her pet chicken for yeah. dinner? Well, sure. We're letting the chicken go to waste. What the heck? <laughs> Uh, oh. so just, that, now, did she did she actually did she eat it while she was sobbing? I don't think she ate a bite of it. No, <laughs> yeah. she no, she didn't eat the chicken. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, so yeah, we uh, that was that was about the extent. Uh, life was good. Uh, I was tutored. Mom and dad taught me. That might explain some of my deficiencies in education because I never did. Dad taught math and he was terrible. Dad was a very smart man, but he's a horrible teacher. Yeah, I, I don't think <laughs> math runs in the Watkins. It's not James. a math. We don't have the math gene. Yeah. My Asian brothers and sisters, I love them because they're just mathematically inclined. <laughs> My Korean brothers, this is for you. So Steve, we're shouting out to Steve? Steve, you're a lucky. Steve, this is for you, buddy. Uh, hey, brother, uh, you have the math gene, I hope. <laughs> anyway, or maybe not if you're in comedy. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> we love you, Steve. That's right, Steve. We miss you, bud. Come come to Kansas. Hey, if you, you, a, if you isn't he welcome to crash here? And Steve, if you ever get here, or if you ever come with Jeremiah, we'll give you a place to stay. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, invi- you're invited. And the, the door is open. There you so. go. Hey, Dadu, where did you get that stuff? I tried. My philosophy about pool is to try to intimidate your opponent. So I thought, I thought I'd see if I could get the intimidation. Where did you get these gloves and these boots? Where do you think I get everything? It's what? called a dumpster dive. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? This is terrifying. Dead, that is terrifying. Dead, 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 dead. <laughs> Where did you get that? He's just waving. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. So scary. <laughs> a new costume for stage. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's, that's that dude. <laughs> 
So uh, then, of course, now I had lived in Jamaica right before we went to the Caymans. You lived in and Jamaica, too? We lived in Jamaica almost a year. I didn't know that. When I was about five years old, and then from six to 11. What was the reason behind living in Jamaica for a little bit? Uh probably disorganization on the part of the mission board i think they didn't have a place ready for us yet or another oh, okay. missionary was still there and they were leaving how, how far is jamaica from the cayman jamaica islands from the caymans you can you can almost see if you're up on a high bluff there's a there's a bluff in the center of the island kind of like a wedge of cheese it's about 200 feet at one end and then tapered off to nothing if you're up on the end of the bluff that was 200 feet high you could see cuba from there Really? And I'm thinking Jamaica is a little farther away than Cuba, so we couldn't see Jamaica. But Jamaica was probably a couple hundred miles, mm-hmm. and Cuba's 80 or 90. In fact, my mom and dad went back to the Cayman Islands after I was uh, older, and they had Cuban refugees that actually they put them up overnight in their home that had gotten on a boat and got there from Cuba that escaped Castro's uh, oppressive regime. Uh. And, of course, they were really nervous because sometimes the Cubans would come after them. Yeah, and so they immediately got him on a plane and got him to Miami, because there's, as you know, a strong Cuban presence in Miami. Of course, but uh, yep, those were uh, the good times. Uh, gosh, uh, it was paradise. Uh, and then, of course, a little older, we came back home and went to Bible school for a few years, and then went to the Virgin Islands. That was a whole different experience. Better or worse? Worse. The Virgin Islands, now we've gone from the 50s to the 60s. Racial tension here. This is early 60s when the cities are burning. Martin Luther King uh, you know, was, was active, but there was the, the movement was finally for racial equality. It was, was very strong. Now, and, did you feel that in, uh, or did you recognize it in the Cayman Islands when you were a kid, that not, there was racial the, tension or not, anything? There was none. The, the racial tension was non-existent. Uh, in the Cayman Islands, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but in, in the Virgin Islands, these were descendants of slaves, different culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Carib Indian uh, culture was that the heritage from the Caymans was more Carib Indian and mixture, but there was a high percentage of blacks from, and because St. Thomas was American territory and land of opportunity compared to some of the other islands, you would have people from all these other islands that would immigrate to St. Thomas, yeah. St. Croix, and St. John. And so I'm I'm there now. I'm uh, 15 years old, and I'm in uh, uh, the Virgin Islands. And uh, all of a sudden, now I'm. Uh, this is a, a different kind of experience. I got the freedom of kind of getting out from under my folks' wings. I can still remember my first job. I went to work at Soto Furniture Store, and Andre Soto was he was quite the character. I could. How did, say, now, how did you apply for this job? Um, there's a little furniture. He had a furniture outlet on the main drag in St. Thomas, and then he had a furniture store out in the outside of the city. And people would uh, get a, if somebody wanted to look at furniture, they would get go from there. And a van would come pick them up and take them to the main store. Yeah. And I was put in charge. And here I am, 15 years old, and I'm put in charge of this little store. And so I would just simply call him and tell him we got people that want to come out to the store. So that was my first job. I think I just walked in there and asked for a job. And got it. And I'm, I will say this. If you were white, you did have, even then, there was still some prejudice. So you kind of got preferential treatment if, if you got if you were from there and you were white. It yeah. was easy, easy to get a job. Yeah. Plus, the economy was good. Tourism was the mainstay of, of the St. Thomas, St. Croix economy. It was good. My sister went to work at a Virgin Isle Hilton in a jewelry department. And I'm working in the furniture. We both had jobs at 15 and 16. And uh, Andre Soto is kind of a pervert. <laughs> he did. I can still, I can still remember one of the uh, uh, his employees were standing there, and he simply reached over and began to sexually harass this employee. <laughs> oh yeah, he grabbed him by the, you know what? And, grabbed and him? Grabbed this employee? Yeah. Wait, so Andre Soto is a, is a he guy? He was the owner. He's the owner of the furniture store, and he was sexually and harassing another his, male. One of his employees in the sixties. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah. just going for his balls. He just reached over and did like, like his, <laughs> yeah. This and he did it in front of me. Well, I think it was a test. I think he was messing with me to see what my reaction would be. I see if you laughed or liked it or anything. Well, I did. I laughed out of nervousness. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <it's, laughs> but you know, kid would do but i didn't rat him out because i didn't want to lose my job yeah so i didn't dare so tell what about him. the other guy he well he was he was from puerto rico and see these andre soto is from puerto rico 
and he hired nothing but Puerto Ricans. So you were the only white guy amongst all yeah. the Puerto Ricans? Uh huh. <laughs> and I knew just enough Spanish. He put me with his his grandfather to help assemble furniture after I got promoted to the main store. And he's this guy's cussing me in Spanish, <laughs> and I knew it. <laughs> and I knew it, cabron and puta, and, yeah. and, and I said, I know what you're saying, and I understand enough Spanish to know that you're not saying nice things about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one of my most interesting memories of Andre Soto's furniture store. On Saturday, they uh, closed early, and then on the top floor, they had a cockfight. And of course, cockfights are illegal. Even back then. Even back then. Oh yeah. yeah. And if you, that's a bloody sport. They yeah, put these spurs. Chick- yeah. They put these spurs on these. You've, there's uh, Rum Diaries featured it. Uh, I think with uh, one of the uh, famous actors was in Rum Diaries, and they showed a cockfight in that movie. But this every bit is it's bloody. And those cocks, they'll fight to the death till they kill the other cock. Yeah. And they're and of course gambling. Money was flowing, man. There's people waving dollars and So you you've been to an actual cockfight yeah, before. Yeah, I was there. I never told my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dare tell my mom and dad that right. because she's kind of interesting to me. But you know, well, yeah. So, well, you're the son of a of a missionary. You right. don't want to be be, be caught at a cockfight. Didn't want to go to church and say, "Oh Lord, forgive me." I went to a cockfight Sunday. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those are prayers you might say behind. No, but did I, you place any bets when you were there? <laughs> no, you were no, just no, like spectating. No, I wouldn't bet. That was wrong. <laughs> it's okay to go to a cockfight, <laughs> but you didn't dare gamble. You got you got, That's a sin, right? You got to love the blurred lines of Christianity. <laughs> well, you know mom I mean? taught me. I think that was a Bernie Swatkin. My mother had a way of kind of blurring the lines a little bit. Sure, sure. Yes. If uh, somebody else did it, it was a sin. But if she did it, it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I was, feel like that's uh, 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 <laughs> I feel like that's Christianity in a nutshell for a lot of people. <laughs> well, unfortunately, myself included. You didn't say it, but I'll say it for you. Oh, <laughs> uh, so that's one of my men. Of course, uh, then my last job there, I was uh, working for a gift store. And on the main drag on Crumb Prince and Gotti, I think is the name of the main street. How, uh, how long did you work for Andre Soto? I worked for him. Uh, I worked for him for about a year, I think, and then I moved on. Did, did and, you, you only saw him sexually harass one person in front of you? <laughs> well, he yeah, that, but <laughs> he had a, a secretary that, oh, man, she was hot. She was probably about 35 or 40. Yeah. Big, big boobs and she was pretty and yeah and he'd sit there and play guitar and he could play the, the spanish flamenco type guitar oh he could he, finger pick oh, and everything he could go all over that guitar and he would sing when you get to the number one and drive it home <laughs> and then he'd go through the different number when you get to and, and, and it was pretty vulgar but it was funny what do you mean what, what do you mean well we know what drive it home was all about and it was sexual all the way and, and she just i'm said, not familiar and she well, drive it home, of course, means driving it home. Right, right, right. So, and he, he would follow up with some more graphic stuff than that. Like but what? Do you remember? I don't remember, but I will. The funny thing about the secretary, she had a problem with pronouncing words, and she couldn't, a, a sheet of paper was a shit of paper. So, so she was Puerto and, Rican as well? She was Puerto Rican. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you had to go wrap something up, she had to go rape it up. You just go have to rape, <laughs> take a shit of paper and go rape it up. <laughs> Uh, so it was a trip, but then, then I moved on to the gift store. The gift store is kind of blah after after Soto Furniture. Truthfully, I'm in there just wrapping. Well, yeah, that was cockfights and big boob secretaries, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was epic. But yeah, I moved on to the, from that, and I'm uh, basically tourist would buy stuff. This was back when it was a duty free before all this free trade, and mm-hmm. so St. Thomas was duty free. You could spend up to so much money and not have to pay duty or, or import taxes. So we would, uh, a lot of times, tourists bought stuff they didn't want to lug around or take back to the cruise ship, so they would just mail it home, and we'd wrap it up and send it home for them. So I got to, I learned how to wrap a package properly. You learned how to wrap up a package. I can wrap up a, I could take enough shits of, shits of wrapping paper and wrap those packages. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm good at wrapping packages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it makes uh, sense. You worked at UPS years later. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so then we come home and then back into a conservative environment. Now, after all this, now I go back to, to a Bible college. Now, but let, let's rewind a little bit because okay. we're, right. we're covering a lot, a lot, 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 a lot, a lot of years, <laughs> so a, lot of, a years. lot of years okay. in a short amount of time. Okay. Let's, let's rewind a little okay. bit. We'll get to Bible college here in a bit. <laughs> okay. But um, when you, let's go back to the, 
so Jamaica and then Cayman Islands, all between the ages of five was Jamaica, and six to how old six was? Six to 11, so five years in the Caymans, and then two and a half years. In- <laughs> so so what was school like in the Cayman Islands, and did you have like any girlfriends or love interests or anything like that? Of, um, were they white girls? Were the Cayman, they mixed? Not in the Cayman Islands. I was a little boy, and, and, and kind of uh, – I uh, didn't really – have it that all happened just about the time i turned 12 13 and because i was very very aware of sexuality by the time i was 13 and lived in the virgin islands why is that well for one thing we used to to go to church there was a, a if you've seen the movies of the first uh surfers back in the 50s would buy an ambulance because they like to get their surfboards in a long covered vehicle. Right, they could fit so them in there. They'd fit them in there. So they converted them over. And well, we had one like that, only it wasn't for surfboards. It was to take people to church. And they had benches down both sides of the back. And mm-hmm. we'd sit on those benches. And I'm about, I'm now 13, 14. And I'm seated next to this probably 18 or 19 year old black girl. Uh-huh. And she would, pulled her skirt up about halfway up her thighs and she sat next to me <laughs> she knew what she was doing i think i'm pretty darn sure she did <laughs> and i never complained about it either i didn't find any problem with it what she would just, she would hike it up and then she would kind well, of look she, at you to well, see how you'd respond she, well she, yeah. <laughs> uh, i think it was just kind of their nudity and modest immodesty it was not uncommon the girls that were going to school of course they'll walk to school they'd have school buses You'd see a girl stop on the side of the curb, just pull her dress up, squat, and pee. Really? Oh, yeah. And the boys, we in Tortola, uh, in downtown, was Roadtown was the capital of downtown, there were, uh, the boats would come into that harbor, and there would be guys in their teens uh, diving naked. The tourists would throw money in the water, and they would dive down, bring it back up in their teeth. And so, with their, oh, so my mom would cover my sister's eyes. <laughs> yeah, because... <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's teenage boys oh, who are yeah. diving for tips yeah no naked. no okay yeah. i'm just trying to get the whole picture because this sounds like kind of insane uh are these white tourists that are coming in well yes and no uh there's a, you get you get the ordinary flow of traffic from the different islands so there's always there's always traffic in that so islands. who started the who do you think started the game of throwing tips oh, where I, these naked boys would, i would, think it's would just pe- people love to see a diver bring up you know it the, they would throw like a this was back i'm sure <laughs> these weren't dimes <laughs> these are probably quarters or yeah. 50 cent pieces but the guys were they were good enough divers they could they could find them. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. wild. Mm-hmm. The water was keep in mind now. Back in the sixties, water the pollution I think is worldwide has got the ocean was clear. I mean the water was oh yeah it was yeah. extremely clear even in a harbor environment. So you could see the coins with the mm-hmm. sun reflecting yeah, off they'd, of it. They'd you would, it. Yeah, yep. you'd catch it. You bet you. And so, so, so but I can still remember my mom covered my sister's eyes. <laughs> But it was well, yeah, because there's all these teenage boys in there, and and in the Christian church, they're oh, you know no. modesty, not, modesty oh, and nudity, I like know. you know, you're trying to cover that up that's as much right. as possible. So, so the, the, the girl on, on the bus, she wasn't wearing panties, and she would hike up her skirt. Well, I don't know that I, I never got that far into the deal. <laughs> <laughs> My imagination, maybe. Uh, yeah, but yeah. She was cre- She was just probably getting comfortable. It was hotter. There's no air conditioning now. This is you're talking the tropics, and it got hot. Right, right. And man, I'll take it get funky. In there. You talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, get a little funky well, in there. Well, pee and the JJ smells. <laughs> I, I at the time I didn't know what all that was. Probably a little bit of all of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so yes, I had good memories of her. She she was my sexual awakening. I guess you'd say. Was she the first girl that started kind of revving your engines a little bit? Yeah, and it was downhill from there. <laughs> but yeah, and then I got over to St. Thomas, and I. I was attracted to there's a missionary's daughter that uh, I forget how I met her, but I, my first date was a walking date. I didn't have a car, and so we uh, we walked t- uh, from downtown back up to somewhere in St. Thomas. But the things you're funny, the things you remember details. You don't remember a lot of the the uh, things, but I remember walking by a distillery for rum. Yeah. It was Ron Rico Rum, and they distilled it right there in downtown St. Thomas, one of the side streets. And, man, the smell of rum being made is horrible. I mean, it, it's just got a funky smell. I never I never liked rum 
probably because you grew up around that smell and stuff yeah. like that. You grew up around the distillery. Yep. I never never cared for I was a mixed drink. I mean, I, I learned to, to drink it, but but as far as just uh, it was just kind of something I stayed away from. Hey, Dad, do how come you have your uh, your black wise man all the way over here in the corner? <laughs> it's not Christmas time yet. I'll bring him bringing him out here just right after Thanksgiving. We're gonna. I, I, he's the only one of the three that I have. So. <laughs> Doctor Thunder Diet. How come you get Dr. Thunder, Dad, yeah? Why? Because Dr. Pepper Zero is three-something a, a liter, whatever, and this is like a dollar twelve. And I'm a cheapskate. I'm an old guy. <laughs> old people, you know, we'll drive across town to save a dollar on some soda pop. <laughs> Who cares if you burn $10 worth of gas? And I still remember... I was, I was, this is back when I was at the furniture store. I still remember the day that Kennedy was shot in 1963 because I was there and I was, I remember tuning the radio, a Grundy German radio. We, Japan wasn't making radios worth of crap back in the sixties. Yeah. This was back, they called it Jap crap back then. And in fact, this was actually, yes, yeah, 63. And uh, the Japanese got strong in electronics in the seventies and eighties, but I can still remember. And, and yes, uh, uh, the, uh, at Andre Soto's uh, yes. furniture store, that's mm-hmm. when you found out JFK died? Uh, yes. They so died. what was going through your head? as? Because how old were you at that point? 15? Uh, 15, yeah. So what was going through your head as as uh, an American? Uh, it was a shock. The big fear, the big thing, is backtracking back to the Caymans, I still remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that was uh, powerful stuff because Cuba's 90 miles that's, away. Yeah, from that's us. not that's real close. And uh, and yeah, even before that. Now on the way to the Cayman Islands, uh, before the Cuban Missile Crisis, during the Cuban Revolution, we stopped. We had a stopover in Havana. It was a small plane uh, from Miami to Cayman, to Grand Cayman, or it was a small plane, and they had a stopover in Havana. And I can still remember. <clears throat> The soldiers in brown uniforms coming aboard the plane to search the plane, and you could hear gunfire in the background. The revolution was going on. Whoa. So I've lived history twice. Yeah. And, or three times. So you got you you were one of the you were one of the planes that got stopped and searched. They were searched any plane coming on they were wanting to make sure no contraband was coming on. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So yep. Yeah. So <laughs> So yes, a lot of good memories. Got a, it, it was it was a great time to be alive. Yeah, that's cool. You got your hiking stick back here. Oh. I want to I want to showcase that <laughs> okay. for the camera. Can you reach it? Oh yeah, oh, man. And you, you figure man's got to be prepared, right? Yeah. So my okay. dad showed me this hiking <laughs> stick, <laughs> and then at the tip of it. You want to pull that off? <laughs> He's got a full well, on. You never know when a, a rabid raccoon or, or you don't know. I mean, it's, it's just self-defense. Purely. I'm sure. Not a, I'm, I'm not in offensive warfare, but I do believe in protecting myself. Sure. So, yes, we're ready for anything here in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I need to doctor it up a little bit so it doesn't look quite so threatening. But it's <laughs> yeah, it looks a uh, pretty serial killer right now. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? But it's a good piece. Uh, it's a good piece. <clears throat> we make our own weapons here too. We make our own bump shotguns. And <laughs> what were your? What, okay, so let's. Uh, I'm I'm fascinated with with uh, you living on the islands and stuff when you were a kid. Okay. What kind of friends did you have that that you made through school and through and through uh, church and stuff like that? The I had a lot of as a child. I, was, I made friends easily. And I had friends that, that we'd play played together, and and we uh, uh, we fished for the little fish together, and we also made our own slingshots. And uh, you made you made me some slingshots as as a kid. Mm-hmm. Made our own slingshots, and With, I don't know uh, what the difference is, but rubber was different then than now. It was man, it more was elastic, more much more elastic. I don't know what's changed. Do you think that it was just <laughs> it's just more true to the rubber trees where they were finding I, I it believe, on stuff I like that? It was more less synthetic, more it was real. Yeah. Because they were fantastic. You, you, these kids down there that were good with them, they could kill a bird in a tree Rip. with, with oh, a slingshot. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So we made our own. The and also in the fifties, you know, this yeah, we lived in paradise, but the people didn't have any money. It was not uncommon for people to make shoes, a sandal out of of car tires, and cut them out to the shape of their foot, and then wow. use thatch from the palm tree. We would made a good rope. They made rope from the palm tree fronds, the the, the green uh, 
leaves of the palm tree, and they would make their own rope, uh, and uh, they would make their own shoes uh, back in the 50s. And uh, this is before, and then all of a sudden, uh, that was before much, there was no tourism at all on the Cayman and Cayman Brack. Came, Grand Cayman was more, uh, grew up and, and probably came into the 21st century a lot uh, quicker than, than Cayman Brack, but it was mm-hmm. much more isolated. You, I don't know if you remember this, but you made me a, a slingshot when I was a little kid. Out of what you carved out of wood, and then you you got some bike tire, mm-hmm. and uh, cut the ru- cut and, the ru- and you cut leather out of one of your loafers. <laughs> yep, made the, the pouch for the rock. Made the pouch for the rock, mm-hmm. and uh, we had a woodpecker on the side of the house, and you said. You said, see if you can <laughs> hit that. Did you? I got its wing, but then it flew away. <laughs> so you crippled that woodpecker. Probably. That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, sir. And, um, oh, also the young kids down there, if you probably if you watch a movie of the 20s and 30s, you see a kid pushing a bicycle rim with a stick. Yeah. That was a big deal. You see the kid running down the road just pushing the bike, pushing the rim with a stick. That was just that recreation. Just recreation. Or they made their own spinning tops. And these guys, were they would carve us a, a top mm-hmm. without a wood, and then they would drill a hole or make, find a way to get a nail into the center, and then they would grind the nail down. And, so, and then they would uh, use fishing line and with a little wooden uh, – holder to keep it in their, their fingers and they could take that top over their head and they could spin that they could throw that top and hit a circle six seven eight feet away from them and land that top in that circle and you could just watch it spin they were that good they were it. that good yeah yeah they were good bicycles uh, a lot of people travel by bicycle and these were the english bicycles and uh with they had the little generators on there, you could see mm-hmm. them at night. The, as they stopped pedaling, the light would go dim, and uh, so they didn't have modern. This was way before alkaline batteries, needless to say. Yeah, and even regular batteries were too expensive, uh, so people just had their own little generators. But now, um, in the in Tortola, I lived. I didn't tell you about Tortola before I went to St. Thomas. We lived on the in the British Isle of Tortola for a year, mm. and I. Uh, the other people on, on the island, they had English bicycles, which have the smaller frame. I had an American bicycle, which was probably a Schwinn or a Western Flyer from Western Auto, and it was a big frame. Well, the kids, the local kids thought that was hilarious. They called me Donkey Boy. They thought my bicycle looked like a donkey. So I hated their guts. <laughs> they called me Donkey they Boy. They had accent, the British accents and everything? Oh, yeah. Here comes Donkey, donkey Boy. boy. <laughs> Needless to say, that scarred me for life. (laughs) They called you Donkey Boy? Donkey Boy, yeah. (laughs) You just went back to that place a little bit. So I still want to go back and kill them. (laughs) (laughs) Did you have any kind of retorts? Like what what kind of a kid were you in that that regard where did you find ways to stick up for yourself or did you laugh it off or what kind of kid were you? I probably ignore, I didn't run to mama because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, Gosh, at 14 years old, I'm like 5'11". I'm very tall for my age. Yeah. So they didn't, there's only one time they tried to taunt me and to get me to fight them, but there was a group of them. And I wasn't going to take a group right, of them on. Right, So I did just kind of laugh it off. I never ran, never ran from them ever. But, uh, and I had, I did have a little boat where I would actually go out and get away from everything. And it wasn't a fancy boat. It was a pretty simple <laughs> rowboat, but I could get out. Probably no. We're not talking no life preserver, none at all. Yeah. And I'd get out there and take a fishing line and try to catch bigger fish. But then that was my get. That was my kind of my escape from reality. Sure. But I hated. I, I the people in the church were very kind, very compassionate. They're wonderful people. But the ones we didn't go to church with, of course. Uh, we, You're just of, Americans we're amongst. Amer- and, well, and, and keep in mind, this is back when the this racial stuff's really getting bad in this country. So they hear about America, not as this panacea, but uh, the place where me, their blacks are being mistreated, which was true. And uh, the uh, they associate the, you with that a little bit. They would. I mean, the kids. They. I felt it in, in their their dislike for me. And of course, now in the adults, as we got into St. Thomas. The by now the '60s, you've got the Rastafarian culture, so you have the uh, the the again the local people uh, that knew you knew who you were were fine, but there was there was some there was tension, 
uh, between uh, if I, I can still remember the the Rastafarians with their aloe and their hair and the the, the the dreadlock. The whole you see these football players with these long dreadlocks. That all came from the Rastafarian culture. Yeah, yeah it's all it's Rastaman. Yeah, the Rastaman had the dreads. Yeah, <laughs> the, and he smoked the ganja weed. When was the first time you smoked the ganja weed? <sighs> Probably when I was about eighteen. Yeah, 19. where was that? Uh, back here, I never smoked in the islands. I mean, I was only 16. So when I got right. back here, well, see, I was abandoned at 19. My mom and dad abandoned me. They, they Well, let's get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I can laugh about it. I never thought about it at the time that I was abandoned, but I was. They decided we came. So they get back. We're back in the, we've come back now, 16. We go back to the, into the church and Bible school culture. And, but. You know, now all of a sudden we've tasted the, you know, there's an old saying, once the guy has been to gay Paris, he doesn't want to go back on the farm. And not meaning gay. I mean, just the word gay meaning fun, loving. Happy, fun. Happy. Yeah. yeah. So, and we'd kind of had a taste of our own freedom. We've had our jobs. Uh, I was going to night school. I went to American School of Correspondence. So I'm working full time and going to school in the evening. Mm. So I have this freedom. So we come back here and now we're under mom and dad's thumb. And we were fighting it. There's, there's, it was just not working real good. And mom and dad chucked it. They gave up. They, rather than stick with us in probably the most formative years of version, I think, of any teenagers is about the 18, 19, 20 years when they're making life decisions. They bailed on us. They went back to the Cayman Islands for another five years. So you were just in the States and had to figure it all out or what? Oh, no. They figured it out for us. They wanted us to keep the house and they, so we could make their house payment for them. <laughs> that way they didn't lose their equity in their house. And so. So oh, yeah. so you and Aunt Marilyn had we to... We had the mom and dad's house. Hoof the, the house bill? We, oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. oh, well, from the time I was 13, what well, time I had a job, I gave a third of everything I made to mom and dad. Really? Of my take home. A third. Room and board. <laughs> since you were 13? Well, since I was... Well, actually, well, more like 14 or 15 when I got my first job. That's still impressive, though. Didn't have much choice. Yeah. But no, they, they told us... When we moved from Tortola to St. Thomas, they let us know... We went ahead. The missionary board hadn't authorized us to go, but we were supposed to have really gone there to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then, well, it's not ready. Go here. Mom and dad said the only way we can afford to live in St. Thomas is if you guys will help us. Mm -hmm. So, And we wanted to go to St. Thomas, so we were motivated. I never had any complaint about the, the board at the time. Now, later when I got back to America, that's a different story. And my dad had issues health issues and wasn't able to work and had <laughs> what, what were his because i like i know you know from my memories of grandpa he you know i i kind of have a strange kind of like recount of grandpa just because when i have me good memories of him where we'd like listen to royals games and stuff together mm -hmm. but a lot of times he would kind of be in his own world where we'd be playing with grandma he be kind of always doing his own thing. Well, a lot of, that was mainly drug induced. My dad was pretty heavily hooked on on pain pills, narcotics, yeah. Valium. I don't know how much was uh, this opiate, uh, this new stuff. Because he but, was uh, World War Two. He was the, dad was in Philippines in World War Two. He served with honor, uh, an honorably discharged, but he was badly emotionally scarred from the war. Dad was a company clerk in the in the in his unit, and he would have to send back the effects of the guys that had died in battle. And, and write a letter to the parents. He had to write the letters, mm -hmm. saying that they had passed. Oh my! So goodness. that was so he brought that back, all that baggage back with him, and he was a very reserved, quiet man anyway. And so it it messed him up. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, you know, one thing that I always uh, kind of associated with him was he had restless leg. He mm -hmm. was always mm -hmm. always doing this, and I do this just out of like a the, more of like a I think an ADD thing. I think <laughs> I, I have it too if I'm real tired, if I'm exhausted. Oh, I'll, you start doing this? I start, I, well, just can't get comfortable. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, just can't get can't get my feet in the right position. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it came back and then now all of a sudden mom and dad's got their controls on us and we're not, we're kind of had a lot of freedom. So they decided to go back to the Caymans and uh, and now I'm uh, working uh, at, uh, Hall, went to work at Hallmark Cards. When, when he, when you, they were going back and forth to, to the Caymans, was he, just at a place where he it was hard for him to um 
I mean, he was he was the the pastor at, at these. It, like, yes. how much was he preaching, and how much was? Because you said he had difficulty working in some. Capacities. Dad had yes, he had difficulties working uh, and holding doing anything for any length of time. But as far as a, a minister, uh, he was able to function. Mom was a much better preacher, much more of a people person than Dad was. But Dad was respected. Uh, we used to joke about it that mom was a, treated like the queen in the Cayman Islands. Many years later, decades later, people still sent her money. And we're not talking about 10 or $20. They'd send her hundreds of dollars just as gifts at Christmas time. Thanking her, her for her time. Thanking her for her time there because they were, uh, they genuinely loved the people and they got involved in the people's lives. They didn't live a, on a high house, big house on the hill. They were they, we, we mixed with the people. We church, we associated with them. We socialized with them. One of my favorite stories about my father, we would have church socials on Saturday night. Mm-hmm. And dad, not that dad was a hustler. And certainly, No, that definitely doesn't run in the Watkins run as, family at all. Dad was in charge of selling popcorn. And so dad came up with the idea that if you got this big cardboard box and put a strap around the box and, and wore it and you had the popcorn right there, dad came up with the idea of a false bottom in the box. So you'd think you're buying the last bag of popcorn and dad might have 20 bags of popcorn underneath the cardboard, but <laughs> but you would have to So man, I better grab some popcorn before it's gone. And then as you bought your popcorn, then dad, after he got away from you, then he'd pull out more popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> that's my father. Wow, that was my. So dad. that's where you get your 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 salesman <laughs> techniques from. Well, between my mom and my dad, I never had a chance, did right? I? So when you learn to bend the truth from your mother and you learn to hustle from your dad, it's good combination. Well, you end up the ultimate salesman. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> you should know, Mister Salesman. Uh, to me, the comedians was one of the best salesmen out there. We're because selling ourselves every night on absolutely. stage. Absolutely, life is a sales game. It really sure, is. sure, it's a sales game. Yeah. So, so got back here, and and that's uh, kind of the way it went. Did that do? Hey, who, who's your favorite, Michelle Pfeiffer, Selma Hayek, or Mila Kunis? Oh, I'd have to go with Selma Hayek. How come? Um. I think there's always something exotic about a person with a different, <laughs> slightly different accent. Uh-huh. You seem to be attracted to Pierce Brosnan. Uh-huh. He's good looking, but it's part of it. It's just freaking English accent. <laughs> <laughs> what are you eating? I'm eating something that's simply delicious. It's southern pecan pie. <laughs> you forced me to eat another slice and you gave me a big glass of milk. <laughs> well, that's, that's what parents do. We, that's our way of showing love to our wayward children that we never get to see <laughs> stand us up. Here comes the guilt. Come, Here comes the come guilt. Come late for dinner. <laughs> and, you know, we're waiting or, or, with our eyes peeled out on the road, looking, hoping, longing. That they'll show up where they said they would, but they never do because they're young people. That's how young people roll. What do you think about Freud? <laughs> Freud? <laughs> a very brilliant man. <laughs> Totally messed up in the head. <laughs> Freud thought, believed that a little boy, he lived in the, in the ego and the superego. I don't get into all that, but he believed that a little boy wants basically to marry his mom and kill his dad. What do you think about that? I think, I think that was Freud's theory. I don't know if he ever was able to prove it, <laughs> but I think maybe he was just talking out of his own experience. I don't know. I was speaking for himself. I call it projection. I think a lot of these psychologists these shrinks because they come up with some cockamamie idea they try to diagnose everybody with their problems. Some of the most messed up people I've ever meet are psychologists and psychiatrists. When, when was the, the, out of all these locations and stuff like that, I know we talked about how you lost your virginity on the last episode, but uh, when did you have a first kiss like the, where you were going on dates and stuff as a teenager uh, before that? I don't think I really did. I, I got... Um, yeah, I I got a little peck, I guess, when I, my my senior, well, they didn't call them proms, they were junior, senior banquet, mm-hmm. a little redheaded girl. My mom and her mom were best friends, so they wanted us to date. And right. It was kind of a planned deal. It didn't work out very well for us. Sure. And that's probably where I got a peck. But then I started, a buddy of mine was dating this real pretty girl, and he had said, she's got a sister I want you to meet. 
And oh, we'd get out there. We'd we 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 started double dating. Oh man, we'd go out and I'd make out till I was sweat rolled off of me. I'd be so worked up. And yeah, we never did anything. We just get you know we'd get just get. Did never give you up. a little pat on the pecker? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. No, that was that was later. That was my Catholic girlfriend. <laughs> my my first my first. I'll never forget. She was Catholic. Kath, Kathy. I won't say her last name because she might be alive, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Kathy was my first uh, girlfriend, and uh, that was pretty amazing to go from zip to z- zip to zap over nothing to everything. Yeah, from nothing to everything. <laughs> <laughs> and the girls at Hallmark. One of the reasons, oh, mom. One of the reasons I went in the military uh, was. Uh, I tried to go. I tried to go in the military at seventeen. I'm, I'm living at home, and and your and mom and dad wouldn't sign they papers. Wouldn't sign, and, and yeah. the reason I tried to go in the military, in addition to me paying this one third of my income, and making my own car payment, you got a sweat bee that's trying to. I yeah. see. And and other than, so I'm giving them my income a third, and I'm also make paying my own tuition. I'm making my own car payment, my own insurance. They tried to tell me who to date. And yeah. they didn't like the fact that I was dating the girls across the street because they were a different religion, and mom didn't approve of it. And that's when I tried to go in the military. Yeah, and then that's what, soon, that was, that was, that was and, the the and, final. And point. that was, but that was also the shot across the bow. They realized that they had lost control; that we weren't kids anymore. Yeah, because you know we're now eighteen, nineteen years old. And well, especially you doing all that stuff. You yeah. working your own job. You you mm-hmm. you're paying for your own car, yeah, and then you're full-time also full time job. A senior in high school. I've got a janitor job. I'm working two thirty to eleven o'clock at night. And uh, I did a little bit of janitor work with you back <laughs> in high school. Yep. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. The doctor's office. That's right. You did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, it was all kind of. Kind of wild and crazy, but no mom and dad. So now we go from one extreme to the other. Now total freedom. Now I go to church if I want to go to church. Well, that's, a, that's an yeah. odd thing that uh, extremities are are part of the Watkins it, life. It would appear that that is a part <laughs> of them. And unfortunately, that was the nature of my, even the religious nature of it. It was, uh, it was all, uh, ex- it, there was a lot of extremism in, in that whole makeup of the uh, the religious nature of, of my childhood and, and young young adulthood. For example, I would go to church on Sunday night, and I'm not, not proud to say this, but I'm you know my sister and I are sharing a home, uh, so I have no restraint. I would head for downtown and go to a strip. There's called Strand Art Theater. I still remember it to this day. Yeah, burlesque. And I would go to, after I'd gone to church on Sunday night. I'd head for a burlesque show. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Well, that's a new take on a double feature. If I've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some double D's there too. <laughs> I, I learned that a woman can twirl when you can see them twirl those little spinning things opposite directions. It's amazing. The nipple tassels. Yes, the nipple tassels. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. But now, where it got really, but the, my my favorite was in the Marine so Corps. So would you feel wait wait before we get to the <laughs> Marine Corps story? Would you feel any kind of like remorse or anything after you went to the burlesque show after church on that Sunday night? Oh, I would when I went back to church. There's something I didn't feel at the time. <laughs> but I'm certainly have felt it after. I'd go to church and I'd feel like like crap. I, I was, yeah, I did wrong. You know. Yeah, I'd yeah, yeah. Sorry and ask God for forgive me. And, but then, and, would you go back to the burlesque show the, the next take weekend? A break for a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Oh. No, I'll tell you what. So you said, and then in the Marine Corps. Well, in the Marine Corps, now you now all of a sudden now you that was when the final straw, man. It was it was I was done for the by then. <clears throat> in the Marine Corps, uh, we'd go on summer camp, and we're going here here this imagine California, in nineteen sixty eight sixty nine when everything's just going wide open with drugs and sex and free mm-hmm. love and and uh, and man. It, go out there, and I still remember I can see a girl on stage dancing, and and she could put four quarters on her belly, and she could either roll the end of two quarters into her G string, or she could take the center ones, the most amazing torso muscles I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Wait, what do you what do you mean? She could take with her muscle or with her stomach muscles, she could move those quarters. She could make those flip those quarters. I'm serious. <laughs> I figured, doggone, what else can she do if she could do that, right? 
<laughs> that so, was at a concert that you went to? No, that was at a, a strip short. A strip short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. But you know what? Do you, do you remember the name of your favorite strip club back in the day? <sighs> Oh, there was, this, this trail is long, Jeremiah. <laughs> I, like this trail like is long. I remember names of girls, but I don't remember. I still remember Misty in Dallas. Whew, dang. <laughs> they, they could dance on the tabletops, and, and, and you, could, you could touch their feet. <laughs> uh, oh, who else do you remember? Oh, uh, in the Marine Corps. Oh, my goodness. I remember going, I remember going, well, we were, I'm still on active duty, and I go to, uh, no, this was on a summer camp. We go down to, they, well, they tell you, you go out for the first day, you get out to California and say, okay, guys, now, Tijuana is off limits. <laughs> <laughs> you, and if you go down there, and we have to bring you back and pull you out of the Tijuana jail, yeah. you will get busted. Yeah. You'll have the MPs from the Navy bring you back, sure, and then you'll get busted. You'll lose your rank. Well, we still went to Tijuana anyway, and I can still remember sitting in this bar in Tijuana, and this dancer is completely nude, and she, this guy was tipping real good, and she just walks up to him, and she's he's seated, and she's standing, and she just proceeds to put it right in his face, and I can remember him having kind of like this right there. Right in front of you? Oh, yeah, right here at the club. This was Tijuana, man. It was wild open. You little boys on the street, you want my sister? She's virgin. These little <laughs> hustle. Oh, yeah. The little boys would be hustling, pimping their sister or their mother, whatever. <laughs> so it was wild down there in the 60s, man. It's crazy. Yeah. crazy. Is that one of the craziest things you saw in Tijuana? Yeah. I got a little in Tijuana, too. <laughs> she made me wear rubber. You had sex in Tijuana? Well, blowjob. <laughs> oh, she made you put on a condom for yeah. a blowjob? Yeah. 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 That sucked. <laughs> Not well, for her, it did. Oh, but yeah, it was, no, it was. But the clubs out in California were wild. I can still remember uh, a club where you go into the bathroom and look through. You can see a guy shooting up in the in the in the stall of the bathroom. Really, drugs were everywhere. It was crazy back then. What's the hardest drug you've ever done? I've never done anything more extensive than acid. Yeah. Yeah. Acid. Yeah. Acid. Cocaine? Never done coke. Never Interesting. Done. Uh, my philosophy is if it's anything, anything more uh, enticing or more addictive or more uh, dangerous or as far as to me, <laughs> being my personality, I probably should stay away from all of it. Yeah. But I just I didn't want to take the chance. Yeah. And there's a joke. Well, there's an old saying about coke. The cocaine is God's way of telling you you're making too much money. It's uh, expensive. Yeah. And uh, in talking to people that have used it, you can drop a couple hundred dollars in a matter of a couple hours. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you, like, you said you've had some acid trips in your day. Do you remember any specific visions or any, like, trips that you had? Yeah, I can remember one in particular where I'm sitting at, a, I'm looking in a mirror, and it's like I'm going back into, I, I'm like I'm looking at a Neanderthal man. I'm not looking at me. And, uh, and I, that's when, and that it was pretty spooky. What do you mean you're looking at a neat? Like, well, you, like, you look like at your I reflection? Changed, like I changed. Don't like they I'm tell looking. you to not look in the mirror when you do acid? No, no one ever told me that. No. I'm pretty sure I that's did, something well, that they tell you to not do. I, just, I get that now, <laughs> but no, no one ever told me. That's and, something I, That's something that I've heard. Hmm. It could be misinformed. I've never done well, it, but I've had a, a friend, I, I had a friend who... It was we used to do acid. Bad and, trip. And th they said that you shouldn't look at yourself. This was just one buddy of mm. mine. He said you shouldn't look at yourself when you're tripping because if it's a bad trip, you don't know, like, you're messing with yourself you're and not. your own, I like, see. reality and everything like mm -hmm. that. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So you look like a Neanderthal version of you? Mm-hmm. That guy's gone back thousands of years. Yeah. It was weird. And uh, now another time... My brother and I were, well, Paul and I, he like to do acid. We do it, some acid together. I can remember going to the swimming pool at the apartment we were staying at. And I can remember the clouds and stuff like that, but really powerful marijuana. Today's marijuana, if you do enough of it, you, you can get a little trippy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, They say that the average THC content of a, a joint back in the 60s was about 3%. Yeah. And now you're talking 25 to 30% THC on marijuana. So it's much more powerful, but that take there's much to get high either. 
you just have to smoke a whole doobie just to get off. Nowadays, you two hits of a good that kind of pot would achieve the same objective. Yeah, on another planet. <laughs> That's right. But I'm reading this uh, book right now. Uh, it's very interesting. It's about the study of people who believe in something called astral projection. Have you ever heard of that? I have heard of astral projection. I don't know a lot about it. Yeah. But, uh, so basically, like back in the day, uh, you, uh, I guess it goes back to even Egyptian times. They have like paintings on the walls where they be- they believed where it, when you were in a sleep state that your you know that the spirit. <laughs> There's some barking spiders out here. <laughs> yeah, they're known to inhabit my backyard. <laughs> yeah. I have to fight them off sometimes. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, basically, the belief is that there's two bodies, the physical body mm-hmm. and the spirit, Okay, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, that uh, people who can learn how to astral project, like when they're in a deep meditative state. You can leave the body? Yeah. Like and that's what they call like an out of body experience. I like, believe I've experienced that a time or two. Really? One time specifically, I can remember looking at my body and going and going to the front door and checking the door to make sure it was locked, and yet I didn't ever leave the bed. So it's like it two places at the same time. When when was this? This was years ago. Was it was it when I was alive or was it? Well, I didn't. Was it before? when you were when when you were born? I didn't do any kind of a drug for like fifteen years. Yeah, I didn't drink, but, smoke. Oh, so it. you were this was dr- you were on you're tripping on something? Probably, uh, yeah, I'd say so. Probably at, when I went to sleep, I was probably messed up. Yeah, and uh, and also, uh, I think some of it you can even control your dreams with. That's the, like lucid dreaming. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's what the book that I'm reading is talking about too. Is there were some books that were they probably weren't good for you. But there's a, a guy named Carlos Castaneda that wrote some books back in the 70s called Journey to Ixlan. And he got into peyote and uh, astral. Basically, he was in astral projection with peyote. Oh. And some of that peyote, you know, the Indians, you know, it's a part of their religion. Sure. They use it in religion. But it's that's some pretty powerful stuff The peyote, peyote is. Wow. And, uh, but, yeah, the, the, I think astral projection, I, you know, Religious, deeply religious people would probably say some of that's demonic. Uh-huh. I, I don't think you can label. Yes, I do believe in evil. I, I believe there's evil. I think some of these murders and stuff. I think some of that is pure, unadulterated evil. But I think there's a whole lot of stuff that's just psychic. That's not either good nor evil. It's just our minds are, are pretty amazing things, right? And they, they, we can do amazing things. In fact, when I was in this, I didn't realize it until years later. Um, the LSD experience was pioneered by uh, Leary, Timothy Leary, back in the 70s. And Timothy Leary was, they were, government was giving him pure Sandoz LSD 25 and for, to, experiment for stu- to experiment with. Yeah. And he said he was communicating with extraterrestrials and they cut him off. <laughs> yeah. And, but yeah, and then Timothy Leary <clears throat> also had something called the womb tank. Where you cut off all sensory, it's a sensory deprivation. So they're like a float tank now. Float, it's a float tank. Yeah. yeah. In fact, float I, tanks are very popular. Are, now. That's what I heard. In fact, I, I want to try one. Do you want to do it the next time I'm I in? I would love to in California. Yeah. The next time I'm out, yes, we'll, sir. We'll go to. I've never done it, but people, well, people told me that I well, should. Well, you cut off all sensory, and, yeah. and you're, you, the mind is isolated. And yeah, I hear that's powerful. And he, so he was duplicating some of the same experiences with LSD in, yeah. in the womb tank. <clears throat> Wow. And he was also trying to communicate with dolphins. And supposedly yeah. they are very intelligent uh, yeah. mammals. Yeah, yeah. But they we know stories where they've saved swimmers' lives and and mm-hmm. uh, in fact, I'll tell you a brief experience. Uh Jan and I our first trip to Florida. Uh we I got way out in you know how in Florida you can go 100 yards out and it's still only <laughs> 4 or 5 feet deep. Right. Whereas Mexico 10 feet out <laughs> it's twenty feet deep. Yeah, yeah. your shelf. So I'm out there, and I didn't think anything about. It. I came back in, and Jana said, "Did you realize you were completely encircled by dolphins?" Wow. And I said, "I never saw one of them." They said, "No, they were all around you." 
I don't know if I, they were protecting me or if there was a shark nearby. Yeah. But they are known to, to protect people. There from might shark. have been a shark that was circling you and the dolphins. I don't were know. But I, being protective. I guess I'm here for a reason. I'm not sure why. Yeah. <laughs> to see my grandson. I that's know. Why. I know. <clears throat> did you Did you have any other? Have you ever had any other like? Um, out of body experience, like like with the sleeping thing, or like a, a near death experience where you felt like you're you were like looking at like a like a life flash before your eyes kind of moment. Uh, no, I haven't. I've I've had what I think one is one supernatural experience when uh, your your sister Jessica the night she died. Mm. I may have told you about that. I think I might have before. I don't know. I was working on. I still remember a black RX seven in my garage. And I was doing some body work on it, and a powerful something came over me. Said you are going to be visit. You are being visited by heavenly creature or creatures. You're, you're in. You're, there's and and all I could think. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy of this. And about ten minutes later, the phone rang, and the hospital called and said you need to get to the hospital immediately. And I think at the moment she died, I think the angelic presence kind of came by or maybe it was her spirit leaving the earth that came by me yeah but it was that's the most powerful experience i've ever had wow well but um on a brighter note yeah we've uh the joy of seeing the grandchildren and see my daughter now that uh is uh also uh Got given me a grandson, and uh, seems like the the uh, plans are for maybe another baby there. So life's full. Life's been good. Been awesome. It's been it awesome uh, doing another episode with you on the on the podcast. I well, do. I have enjoyed it. I hope I didn't say too much or run my mouth too much. <laughs> no, no. I always I always ask you to run your mouth. That's, okay. what, that's, that's what people love all about you. Right. Is you're unabashedly honest on the podcast and. <laughs> okay. uh, well, yeah. if I've offended anybody, all I can say is there's no, I've said the same thing I said a year ago. I love everybody. I don't judge people by their color or their skin or the, or, or what the, their, their sexual persuasions. I feel like we're all a child of God and uh, we're all trying to find this path to happiness and joy. I just want that for all my listeners. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for tuning in.